they can consider they can consider um, regulatory arrangements and they can consider how tech is being developed. And in the context of um, doctrinal research as well, doctrinal researchers can also, I think, hypothesise about the role of um, big tech and digital Switzerland. They can consider the impacts on the democratic institutions. And really, you can't just have evidence-based um, research or a narrative which is created, if you like, by forms of AI, because it's the actual thinking that sits behind a lot of doctrinal scholarship, which is going to be so important in respect of law and technology into the future. The other comments I'll make as well are that I tend to focus on justice rather than law. And uh, in, in my world, if you like, <clears throat> justice is a broader framework than um, law. And I say that because Justice incorporates a lot of dispute resolution processes that happen, for example, outside of the legal system or outside of the court system. And there's also scope, I think, when one's considering justice to consider additional databases and additional bits of material, which we can now bring together with technology. So, for example, if you were looking at therapeutic jurisprudence, you can also consider health and demographic data that might be relevant and in fact give you more insights into the operation of the law and also more generally the operation of the justice system. And then um, my, my middle comment there, predicting the future is always problematic. It's really problematic. And so at the end, I will try and talk about neurotech. Um, again, predicting predictions in relation to neurotech are problematic. And I'm a little bit wary because I gave an interview to a journalist yesterday which um, touched on neurotech. And in the uh, article that was published this morning, the journalist said that Professor Tanya Sorden predicts, predicts that um, implanted neurotech devices will become common in the next five to 10 years. I certainly didn't make that prediction and I haven't yet raised it with the uh, journalists concerned. Um, what I actually said was that they were going to become more common in the next 10 to 20 years. But what I will um, certainly say about neurotech is really the capacity for researchers to consider data that may be recorded often from external devices to give us more insights into uh, what people think and feel about different aspects of the justice system. So in, in general, I'll just point out again in relation to doctrinal research that there are different approaches to legal research around the world. And um, this recent article in the uh, Cambridge Law Journal is um, interesting because it really does highlight that there are different um, traditions that exist across the world so that we have, for example, more social science um, research focuses, uh, foci in um, the US than you might, for example, in the UK. In, in saying this, though, um, and, and sort of re returning to that doctrinal research, of course, AI is becoming more and more um, helpful in respect of um, uh, doctrinal research and even when I looked at this article, um, you can see that on the um, right-hand side, there's actually a link um, to related uh, contact, uh, related content, um, which is generated by an AI um, body, which has searched for and, um, if you like, located material. That's um, UN silo. Uh, and, and you know, commonly, if you're doing doctrinal research, there are a range of different. Um, uh, different bodies and different networks that can assist you and support you. Some of my comments are also related to the work that I did in 2021 on the Judges Technology and Artificial Intelligence book. So I'll refer back to that, as well as a couple of other research projects that you may find of interest. And um, in relation to the more recent work, of course, I've been engaged with an international pro project for a number of years. Um, with Dr. Brian Barry from Trinity College, who's on the line, um, which is really considering and contrasting judicial attitudes to uh, technology. And I'll touch on that work a little bit. Some of what I hope to say is around the how, not just the what in terms of the results. And so I think as um, researchers, we're interested in how research is conducted and how it's put together. Um, normally, when I talk about technology in courts and in the justice system, I talk about three levels of change. And in a sense, that's what I'm going to do as well when I talk about research, that there are supportive technologies that can help us as researchers, there are replacement technologies that can help us, and there are more disruptive technologies that can help us into the future. 
And I, I won't laboriously go through how I define each of these. And some of them have, of course, um, related um, spokes. So something can be um, supportive and then it moves to replacing people and then it, it truly becomes disruptive as well. So there are some technologies which fall within um, all three. And of course, some of the um, movements and shifts in relation to large language models um, fit with that and certainly the more multimodal um, functionality that will uh, emerge over the next five years or so will be more relevant as well. Um, and, and so, of course, we all know that there's lots driving change and there's uh, we as researchers are the beneficiaries of some of that change in that because people are doing more and more online, there's more capacity to track what it is that people are doing and I'm going to talk about some of that tracking and the digitisation of court systems is making a huge uh, impact in terms of law-related research. We won't see that impact fully and it's going to depend a lot on confidentiality and security. So I would encourage any of you who are considering ethical frameworks in respect of you know, new case management design in courts, um, encourage you all to ensure that there is a carve out for researchers so that we can actually access information. But this um, significant shift across the legal system and indeed the justice system means that there is now data available for researchers that wasn't available even a decade ago. And to give you some examples of this in terms of the pace of reform, um, you'll see that um, a lot of case management um, software was really developed close to 30 years ago and inputted into courts. And a lot of the systems that are developed are, are what you call legacy systems in that they select certain data and often a human being entered that data into the system and it would help courts know when to schedule something or um, you know what the outcome of an interlocutory hearing was or indeed record orders. Um, but the sorts of data that was recorded in case management systems 30 years ago was not all that useful for researchers. You might be able to pull out postcode data, for example, and find out where it was that people um, uh, were accessing the court system from to find out whether or not, for example, in a regional part of Australia, um, hardly anybody was accessing the court system and everybody came from metropolitan areas. However, even that case management data was pretty defective in that it didn't actually tell you anything about the demographics of who was accessing the court or what the outcomes were in the context of demographics. So in the past, you actually had to go in and look at hard copy files because often um, what was recorded in the case management system really didn't help us from a research perspective. Some of the newer case management systems, though, have really shifted so that you have digitised case records and there are ways of interrogating uh, the material that is, score, that is um, kept by uh, courts and also by lawyers. And I think this is very exciting for researchers into the future because that data previously was really not accessible other than by, for example, um, surveying lawyers or indeed going through and doing a hard copy file edit and trying to review decisions. There was still some material available, but just not as, as much. Ironically, it's probably the earlier adopters of case management systems where it's going to be more difficult to uh, look through that data. Um, in the case management systems that really evolved over the last 10 to 15 years in countries such as China, they're mo much more modern case management systems. And so you don't have the legacy problems that you've got with some of the older systems. Um, of course, we've had supportive technology around for a while and we've had reasonably good textual analysis for 10 years. It gets better, of course, year after year. And the capacity to translate data is also really exciting for researchers. In the past, um, if you were a, a, a Western researcher, you really had to rely on journal and other articles that were published in English. Um, now, increasingly, we're seeing um, translated material and we also uh, have the capacity to review material in a very different way to pick up not just word use, but to pick up um, other indicators, including sentence structures and other matters that might um, drive us and take us to certain conclusions. And we've got much more sophisticated AI, of course, and over the next eight years, uh, wearable tech, and in the next decade, 
um, I'll point to some of those neurotech developments as well and what they might mean um, in terms of uh, legal and justice research. So it, turning first to supportive technologies, all of us are pretty familiar with um, um, chat GPT and of course there are more specific um, models that have been developed in the legal sector and a number of big firms have developed models which are specific. Uh, and of course, in the educational sector, we're seeing that so that there are closed bot models where um, issues of privacy and confidentiality may not be as problematic as they've been in the past. And we're all aware if we're um, teaching in academic institutions that our students are using um, large language models in different sorts of ways. And, you know, sometimes these are really uh, very useful. Um, they can generate new content from time to time. And we will see more of the multimodal um, foundational models um, emerging over the next few years. And those models are really interesting because they help to decode um, images and also sound. So those multimodal foundation models means that you don't just have to look at text, but you can really look at a range of stimuli to try and form uh, conclusions. So from a researcher, um, for those courts who are actively posting up on YouTube, um, can you imagine um, being able to decode that data in a really effective way and to summarise? Of course, there are always going to be the issues with the hallucinations, and there's also going to be um, some significant issues in terms of the conclusions drawn. However, um, these systems are getting better and better on each occasion. We just have to remember, of course, that they're run by big tech, they're not free, that there are commercial issues and there are ethical issues as well. Um, however, very exciting when you actually consider the, um, the amount of data that they can draw upon. And I've noted the difference between ChatGPT4 and ChatGPT3, 100 trillion parameters with GPT4 whereas GPT-3 was trained on about 175 billion. So this is a, a really different way of considering um, large amounts of data. And of course, as quantum computing becomes a reality, which is some way off still, um, that there's a capacity to, um, to build on existing large language models and also to consider data um, as well. The um, one example that was... Um, uh, put through uh, last year, uh, some of you would be aware of it, the one that was um, aimed at academics was a bit of a failure. Um, um, however, uh, again, um, our packer may come back. Uh, it, it was hallucinating quite a bit, which is problematic in the academic area for real live academics as well as systems. And of course, we've already got judges um, using AI tools um, to, to summarise and Indeed, I can see that um, Dr. Alison Boyle is on this um, on this call. We recently completed a project in relation to First Nation peacekeeping um, approaches. And as part of that project, um, we, we wrote a series of chapters. Some of them uh, involved some extremely complex concepts. And we wanted to create a summary which was user-friendly and could be read by a range of people, including First Nations people, which really the report was directed at. I used um, ChatGPT to summarise um, and actually produce a summary rather than an executive summary, which of course then could be adapted. And it was extremely useful because the language that was used was very different from the language that I might use. For example, we looked at this, but we couldn't look at everything was part of the summary instead of the um, very academic words that I might have used to explain the same uh, concept. So we can use um, uh, these sorts of su supportive technologies to do a lot of things from thematic um, analysis, creation of bibliographies, and it is getting a little better with um, even ChatGPT, although it still hallucinates quite a bit. And then, of course, you can um, use it in, in the educational area and um, we're seeing that um, uh, quite extensive uh, use within the educational area with, um, uh, in particular, chatbots that are built off um, large language models that help respond to questions um, that students might have about different matters. And there, I, I know that you did an education, um, a more education-focused um, seminar, so I don't want to um, talk, talk about that for too long. Um, but I will mention um, one project which is being conducted by a colleague of mine at Newcastle University who I've worked with a, a few times 
she's had a really interesting um, project um, where she's looking at um, the bias um, that might exist when people make a complaint. And so what she's done is she has international students who write a letter of complaint and then she has those same students um, run their letters through ChatGPT to um, revise the letter of complaint so that it's it's differently worded. And then she's running those letters of complaints um, before complaint handlers to find out whether or not they deal with the letter differently um, when it's actually been constructed with ChatGPT compared to the original international student. And that's really around um, bias in complaints handling. And it's about determining where bias exists because her hypothesis, and I think it will be proven by the outcome she has as well, are that um, you know there are uh, racially encoded biases when, um, for example, an international student whose language, first language is not English, uh, writes a complaints letter and that that can have certain outcomes. So it's kind of quite interesting to use ChatGPT I think as well and other large language models um, when you're considering um, modeling and experimental approaches. So um, it, it clearly does hallucinate, it fabricates case law. This is a, a bio that um, ChatGPT did for me um, last year. Um, it, it said that I'd been awarded an Order of Australia in 2018. I was never awarded an Order of Australia. I told my staff that at the time, they were very impressed. Um, but this um, fabrication issue continues and those hallucinations are still there. And, uh, you know, again, getting students to do work critiquing, I think some of that hallucination material is interesting. Um, for researchers, we just need to be aware that it can hallucinate and it can certainly create inaccurate data. And then we've got the, um, if you like, the, um, the, the replacement technologies. And... Um, there's a, an article that I was reading just recently about deep brain avatars, which is on um, e-discovery. It really has nothing to do with um, anything existing as an implant in your brain. However, these avatars are much more effective in terms of e-discovery. And then we've got um, really um, chatbots that are, again, much more sophisticated because um, some of them are really being trained on the large language model area. So when you ask a chatbot a question, it can respond in a way which is informed by um, not only a large language model, but of course other models of data which have, um, have become um, relevant in that particular sphere. All of this gives us some really rich data as researchers if we can access it. So again, I'll come back to that access question. We need to ensure that when courts are considering um, technologies and indeed when law firms are working with technologies, that there is some space for researchers with appropriate ethical clearance to consider um, the outcomes. Um, there are a lot of boutique providers as well. And for example, I reviewed a due um, a couple of years ago, which is a boutique um, provider with quite a sophisticated app that's also got um, a, yeah, paralegal AI and a financial AI associated with it. And again, with ethical clearance, I could uh, consider a huge amount of data um, that came in through the system. So it was really within minutes I could have data about the age of people, about their number of children, about what was happening in the context of their divorce, where they came from, how long it took. And in the past, it was almost impossible to gather that data. Again, uh, from a researcher perspective, if you can set up good relationships with um, boutique providers, there's also, I think, huge capacity in the context of these replacement technologies. Um, and I think some of the government initiatives are really interesting as well. These shifts towards assisting and chatting, I mean, some of them are very problematic and, again, a lot of scope for doctrinal researchers and um, sometimes very difficult to get data from in respect of government initiatives. But there are, is a greater capacity to link data across a whole range of domains, including health and policing, so that when we're considering the impact or effect of something, we're not just looking, for example, at legal costs, which has always been quite hard to uncover anyway, um, but we're actually looking at health and other costs. Um, so it, it's a more holistic approach if you, for example, assessing the well-being impacts of a particular initiative. Um, again, replacement technologies, 
um, you know, it, it's probably a, a few years ago, um, my research team um, designed a web crawler to pick up on language use. They're, they're pretty easy to build. Um, and in a sense, what you do is you look up um, particular words in judgments to try and form conclusions about, in this instance, I was looking at what characteristics make it more likely that something will proceed to a full hearing before a Supreme or a County Court in New South Wales or Victoria. Again, um, you need to pick up, I think, on some of the, um, the lemmatization, which basically means the range of words that you might use to describe something. And uh, again, even ChatGPT can help you with that. So, for example, I was curious about um, what percentage of matters that went to a full hearing involved a death. Um, and uh, so I had a number of um, different words that you could use to describe a death, whether it was grief or passing away and probably about 30 words that you can have, and that's called lemmatization. And it was actually quite extraordinary because um, there were more than 20% of the cases that went to a full hearing where had, a death had been involved. Now, it wasn't necessarily the death of a, a plaintiff or a defendant, um, but it could have been the death of a lawyer or an expert or somebody else. And what that actually tells you is that that may be a complexity indicator. It may be that where there's been a death, there's more likely to be a hearing. Again, you can't just take that on its own. You need to consider other data which might be relevant. However, it's an interesting finding about what actually ends up um, with the, at, a, at a full hearing. I've recently also, um, in terms of replacement technologies, done some micro-expression tracking work with judges. And again, that's very interesting. It's around um, what impression does a judge convey and to what extent are they sort of focused and engaged on a topic. And again, um, there will be more of that from a commercial litigation use, I'm sure, in terms of micro-expression tracking. Um, interesting for judges to consider um, what that might mean. And then there's the data scoop work, which I've already um, uh, touched on from apps. And then you can have thematic um, reviews of Zoom transcriptions, which I've just done in a project on commercial mediation. And more um, interesting work, I think, in relation to um, sentiment analysis. So a lot of people think about um, ChatGPT as being really focused um, on uh, textual analysis and looking at text. But of course, if you link into the GitHub, um, you can now um, devise, if you like, um, a, a way of looking at different um, approaches. And GitHub helps you because you can actually, it's probably less good than it was six months ago, but you can, for example, um, do basic sentiment analysis. So if somebody's complaining to an organization, you can try and assess whether they're really angry or whether they're just frustrated. And so this is useful because it can help with triaging, both within the court system and elsewhere. And again, there's all the, um, the, the paralegal AI and the co-pilot programs that have come through with, um, with Microsoft, et cetera. Again, lots of really interesting data because they're actually accessing data, um, which helps with complexity questions, as well as um, referral and triage questions. That's an example, by the way, of micro-expression tracking. That's um, a photograph of myself with um, Professor Lawrence Bull. And again, tracking um, micro-expressions of my university to indicate whether I'm, uh, and here I'm a combination of happily surprised and disgustedly surprised at the micro-tracking software. Again, uh, imagine um, using micro-expression tracking um, when we're even looking at YouTube videos, what a rich source of data they are. And then you've got these very sophisticated systems. So if I'm looking at more sophisticated systems, for example, smart courts in China, um, you've already got you know, millions of cases that have now um, moved through these smart court system, everything on your phone from beginning to end. Um, you've got evidence that comes through and you know, raises lots of issues around um, you know, whether this process is in fact a good process for the litigants and lots of other questions. However, from a researcher perspective and a data perspective, there are so many different things that you can look at. Um, and, and I think quite interesting in terms of evidence and um, even the dispute resolution processes that might be employed. I'm just noting the time, so I'm not gonna run through with a description of artificial intelligence and 
where we are. However, it is this deep learning part that we are on the precipice of, um, which is, I think, more exciting um, for researchers into the future. And I'll touch on just a couple of matters um, and some of the more disruptive technologies. And there are already researchers who've used um, fMRIs to measure brain activity in different regions of the brain. And I think this is interesting. There is a researcher who I've been engaged with um, in the past who's looked at fMRIs um, to assess, for example, the way that people feel after a mediation compared to a court process. Um, again, quite difficult to do, though. You've got to have the MRIs. And, of course, there's the famous MRI um, study that was done in relation to the, um, uh, the brains of um, serious uh, criminal offenders, um, which showed that there was particular brain activity in a, in a part of a brain as well, which is interesting. It's this kind of merging between um, neuroscience re uh, research, if you like, and law and justice research. However, some of the more disruptive um, tech is really interesting because it can detect when and how people focus. And you can also look at how you might stimulate the brain to make um, better decision-making. So I think from a legal researcher perspective, it's very interesting to think about neurotech and what we might add to a neurotech team or whether we want to build a neurotech researcher into a team. And then, of course, there's this tracking emotion and communication. Um, so from a communication perspective, what words or, or what tone um, might precede a disagreement? Again, very interesting work. Now, it doesn't have to look like this. Um, in that, of course, you've got implants that are developing in the disruptive area and then you've got um, uh, external, if you like, um, trackers and you've also got external stimuli. Um, but I, I thought I'd throw this up. Um, this is a, a, a fairly recent uh, device and I, I'm not encouraging you to go and um, purchase the device or anything else. I quite frankly don't know how well it, um, it works. But this is a, an example of um, one device which is on the market and which um, is already, I think, um, is sort of building on this kind of wearable technology. And what you do is um, this Neurable app, which operates through the headphones, it tracks concentration levels, records streaks of focus, and um, those streaks get, um, get shorter and shorter as your brain is fatigued. And... It can tell you to take a break and for how long you should take a break. Um, could you imagine how interesting that would be if it was um, placed on the heads of lawyers, on clients, and indeed even judges? Um, uh, uh, inevitably, these um, devices are getting smaller and smaller, and as they become commercially available or more commonly commercially available, um, our sort of capacity to get more data will get better and better. I mean, already, if you wanted to, you could actually seek downloads um, a, a, in relation to a smartwatch um, from a witness, and it might tell you when their um, heart rate picked up, or it might tell you a whole lot of other information. Again, some really rich sources of data um, for researchers that really weren't, weren't even envisaged um, even 10 or 12 years ago. And then, you know, linked to this is really around, you know, what is it that, for example, lawyers do? What is it that judges do? And, um, you know, where, where does our focus shift when somebody is telling us, for example, a story as a judge or a story as a lawyer? And again, um, you know, how is empathy being used? And lots of the questions that I've rose, raised before around the future of judges and the future of lawyers can in a sense um, be answered or at least considered by using some of these technological tools. So we shouldn't be restricted to just, I think, considering it from a doctrinal perspective, if we're using these technological tools that actually help us know, for example, who's accessing the system, um, what happens to them when they access the system, we should be able to come up with better system design and we should be able to do more as academic researchers and indeed um, generalist researchers than in the past. Again, there's, um, you know, this, this issue about, um, you know, what happens if you sort of lose the person and to what extent do you lose the person when you're using a lot of these technological tools. Um, there, there is, I think, uh, a huge um, danger that uh, you can take shortcuts and not think things through and perhaps pick up on a narrative which is produced by a large language model 
um, rather than your own. And so it's really important for us as researchers to consider um, the data, but not use, for example, large language models for everything. However, use it perhaps to help us um, test assumptions and help us um, better understand and better perhaps explain the results of our research findings. And so I'll, I'll finish there with questions um, and hopefully haven't talked too much over time. I know that Marina probably has some comments as well and I'll stop sharing my screen. It's been a pleasure to be here and 